of Lee Sung Mi. We never fear more to even live in Patarizan. We have to forget that it is Pio, the potential to be able to do it. We have to do it. We have to do it. From a land so uncompromising, where failure often means death, comes a story of hope. This illiterate son of a peasant farmer would one day explode the myth that one of Africa's greatest problems can only be solved with help from outside. The odds were stacked against him. But against the received wisdom of the time, and faced with daunting challenges, he has emerged as a pioneer in the fight against the encroaching desert. This is his incredible story. The story of Yakuba Sawadogo, the man who stopped the desert. There are many areas across our planet where deteriorating climatic conditions meet head-on with extreme poverty. None more so than this bleak belt of land between the Sahara Desert and the rich soils further south. It's known as the Sahel. It would seem that stories of doom and gloom are all that the outside world gets to hear of this place. Throughout the 1970s and early 80s, this region suffered relentless periods of drought and famine. As the desert conditions got ever closer, hunger forced more and more people to give up on their homeland and head for the cities. But away from the attention of the TV cameras, something happened that would transform the lives of thousands of people right across this region. This is Yakuba Sawadogo, the man at the heart of this story. These days he's a highly respected figure in his community. But it wasn't always this way. A quarter of a century ago, when he first started his battle to save the soil, no one imagined just how successful he would become. Yet thanks to his work, vast moonscapes of desert land have been transformed into fertile, life-giving soil. Crops have been planted. Forests have regrown. And the people have returned. In any case, the technicians that we are, we have come to constate the extraordinary results that this technique has allowed us to obtain. This makes it that a producer can easily double or even triple his production. Yakuba is really amazing in what he's doing because he never ever stops uh, trying. He's, he's like a scientist, and every year he's adding from his experience. Yasida said that Yakuba Goroga the ending and Toshe Meti Yaneda Tirundu Runda as a man of Wawa Tondu Taya Lansara and Casm Sissing Tom Tom Koba Toma Yakuba single handedly has had more impact on soil water conservation in the Sahel than all the national and international researchers combined. Zamana is not a ticket to change the world. It's a little bit of a ticket. 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 This is Burkina Faso, a landlocked country in the center of West Africa. The tiny hamlet of Gurga in the north of the country is home to Yakuba and his family. In the 1980s, when he was a young man, this place was right at the heart of the crisis. For hundreds of years, the way of life here has changed little. Today, Yakuba continues the traditions of his ancestors. It's seven in the morning, and Yakuba's first task of the day 
is to visit each of his three wives in the family compound to discuss the day ahead. It seems their problems are not that different from parents all over the world. Nisha Chris Ray, a world expert on desertification, has been coming to Burkina Faso for the past 26 years. He has seen this land in the days of drought and knows all too well the knife edge existence on which its people live. Today, he's returning to see an old friend. Je viens voir donc. Oh, ah, ton, ton guess, oh, wow. ce que tu as fait. Oui, yeah, 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 Ah, yeah, on va voir. Oui, yeah, 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 et les gens yeah, sont yeah, là. Que... Ah, on va voir. <laughs> I'm always coming to Yakuba to learn from what he is doing. I'm, I hardly ever come here with good advice because he is a much better farmer. He is such a good farmer, such a store of knowledge. He's a real researcher. And uh, it's interesting that he, Yakuba doesn't read or write. But, but if he would have been to school, he would have been a professor. I come to learn from him. Over the last 25 years, I've been coming here to visit you and uh, I have learned a lot, a lot from you. And I've always been sending farmers and other visitors to your place. You have been a very precious source of inspiration to me and many other people, which is invaluable. And I hope to come back for many years. So just what has he done? How has Yakuba tackled a problem that has eluded so many international agencies with their big solutions and big money? Fifty years ago, Yakuba was just a seven-year-old boy, far from home. His parents had sent him away to a Quranic school in the neighboring country of Mali. For the young pupil, it would be a grueling regime of physical labor and relentless memorizing of the Quran. The guy is so good, the song of the can kay so good. But PBC can kay by the ticking door to balloon, bow out and fall on one day. I tell some balloon. No more, la mommy a kid in you.
Yamboye <laughs> Thank you, Lawala. You are a piscilla, no? The kid of a say. The Kulu Kuma. O Pamela. No, you come at the right. Ah, you do. Woman may say, I want to know you, Kuma. Need him what don't call it. The King Kuluma, live with him, Sarfana. Et that column did. I'm saying, my little man, I'm human to one of my two blessed city panomia, two blood panomia, one missing the bay one. I can't a young peel, the banger boy, Zakaili, Sane, Uloka, and Namsidma, the Ampanem dog to be. Yasa, The time finally came for the young man to leave the school. But before he left, Yakubu was summoned to meet with the school spiritual leader, the Sheikh. Yemi Sura Noma. I'm telling me as an attorney, she a bonda, a carasamba, a shaker, a tibia caram de mala to rope on me. Yakuba Yakuaka. A water dotty, Moranai, tomorrow ail, ma'am, tomorrow alum tea, you must have a chin, never can go. Mam killing, I killing ya, ma'am, one. Most of my Yaribal 
Yakuba's father died in 1997. He's buried here at the family home on a small plot of land. The crops that now surround his grave are testament to his son's tenacity and vision. After leaving the Quranic school, Yakuba opened a stall in the local market. For the first time in his life, he would taste real success. I think that whole period between 1975 and 1985 was a, was a period that where there is more rainfall and where there are more fertile soils. So this really was an area of, of out-migration, substantial out-migration. I think often in those days, 25% of the village population left, left the villages. First, <laughs> Yakuba was now without any source of income. His family and friends thought he was insane. But he was about to make the discovery that would change the course of his life. I'm <laughs> I'm 
Zai is the local name for an ancient farming technique. Deep planting pits are hacked into the hard baked earth on a massive scale. Zai are what we call planting pits. They are just pits which are dug in the hard barren crust. Normally, in the times before Yakuba began improving the technique, farmers were cutting the crust of very, very hard soil with their hoe and making small holes. That was it, so water could, could infiltrate into that hole. But what Yakuba did was making those, those pits, as we call them, making them bigger, making them deeper, and also adding some manure to, to them in the dry season. And by doing so, more water could be stored in those pits, rainfall as well as runoff. But also the combination of the water and the manure creates very favorable conditions for plant growth. So on those pots, he could sow crops, plant crops, and they would grow. I must admit that, uh, that uh, I haven't yet discovered disadvantages. I have tried to dug, to dig some zai myself, and the big disadvantage is that it's hard work. But, but those who do not shy away from it, they, uh, they really are rewarded for the investment in labor that they have done. But during the dry season, when there is little to do, labor is not a problem. The issue for Yakuba was that by preparing the ground in the dry season, he was defying the local tradition. I hadn't seen it anywhere else before and there was a lot of pessimism in those days about whether it would be possible to rehabilitate strongly degraded land without using machinery at a substantial scale. There were several projects funded by the World Bank and other organizations in those days trying to, uh, to restore the productivity of the land, but they were not very successful for a number of reasons. So it was way too complex, too expensive, too difficult to maintain by the farmers. So the farmers, within one or two years, began deliberately destroying what was constructed under that, that project. So basically in those days there was no success. And, uh, and that makes it interesting that Yakuba, he developed a very simple system and made a traditional technique more efficient. Yakuba's apparently crazy decision to leave his trade and work in the fields was about to be vindicated. Back at the market, his friends were in serious trouble. Malua, Rahna Woodgo, to 
Nino <laughs> But I but I but I Yakuba's old friends from the market were more than happy to eat his food. But elsewhere, he experienced open hostility. Hostility that threatened to destroy his ultimate dream of stopping the desert. Opposition to Yakuba's methods came initially from the traditional land chiefs. Tingbio, Yabugo, Yatingsoba, Yabambale Libido. Mam Chion Tontaga, Mampaget Nedeli. I'm getting a leaning and biba and tumde. Undaunted, Yakuba continued to experiment with the ancient planting technique but combined it with an idea from an Oxfam-funded project. During the rainy season, most of the rainwater runs straight off the hard-packed earth. But these low stone walls, known as contour buns, ensure that the precious water slowly trickles through and is absorbed into the soil. Together, the Zai compost pits and stone walls proved a winning combination but Yakuba added a magic ingredient, termites. Dorcas Kaiser is one of many scientists who come to Yakuba's farm to study his methods. For her, termites are not the destructive force that wreak havoc wherever they come into contact with man. Instead of battling with these tiny agents of destruction, Yakuba uses their considerable collective power to enhance his work of regenerating the land. Termites act like our earthworms. They're breaking up the soil by tunneling. They're breaking down the organic material, making the soil richer in nutrients. Uh, they turn over the soil amazingly, so they change the soil profile. Um, by tunneling and by opening the foraging holes, the water can infiltrate. They increase after one month foraging, they increase infiltration, rainwater infiltration, uh, by two to four times. Yakuba's place is like the dream place. You cannot find another place like the land of Yakuba, where you can find all the stages of the Sai. It's like a time travel. You start from the degraded area, the initial phase. You have forests of different age. So it's like a time travel. It's a dream place for studying the role of termites in the restoration process. It's like perfect study site. I've brought many researchers to the fields of Yakuba, and they were all incredibly impressed by what they observed. I think that, that most of the researchers will recognize that they themselves have never been able to design such an efficient package as, uh, as, as Yakuba has done. Yakuba is really amazing in what he's doing because he never ever stopped uh, trying. He's, he's like a scientist. He's observing, he's making experiments, and every year he's adding from his experience. Yakuba it's not only about the Zai, it's about a chain of innovations. 
and uh, in that sense he is, he is a bit of a genius. If you look at Jukuba's innovations, it began with the simple zai for growing crops on what used to be degraded land. The next step was to introduce trees into this system of the zai. This 30-acre forest is the result of a phenomenal planting regime started by Jakuba. Twenty years ago, this area was completely barren, but now there is nothing quite like it throughout the entire region. To embark on a project of this scale required skill, determination and incredible vision. There would be no immediate payback. While the people around him were abandoning their villages, Yakuba was out in the fields planting trees. Yakuba, this has really become a, an amazing spot if you look at, at the density of the trees and the diversity of the trees. I remember this, I remember this from 20 years ago and there was basically nothing. And what is so important is that here, if you look around, that the biomass that has been created, it's just amazing. The biomass and the diversity. Ah, it's very good, very impressive. Uh -huh. And all the species, all the species and uh, the of trees and the birds that it attracts. Probably this is the biggest diversity of trees that is being managed by a farmer in this whole Sahel. So, and if you look, consider the starting point of this about 20 years ago, it's just amazing what has grown here. Very impressive. Lovely Sami. We were all Patarizavi. We never fear more to a well even Patarizavi. But if Saik Manda from that year, Yaman Manda from that land saw the Sami over. Bill won't be able to forget the TCPU. The potential to emulate. You won't pull it. I left the song with you. Yakuba's hardest battle has not been with the forces of nature. The attitudes of those around him were to present a far greater threat than the advance of the desert. By the tomb of a son and singing of a sign in Tiliga, Libulantu and sing a tomb to him Kabisi, Batam to their gang. Donk is the Kanga Zima, Namsama. As a Mamsang woman in Edaminga, Batam to your gang and little woman again. Despite this resistance from local people, Yakuba was keen to tell the authorities about his work.
Over 10 acres of crops and newly planted forest were destroyed. But Yakuba was far from defeated. Resistance to Yakuba's work eventually ebbed away as farmers from neighboring villages came to realize he was onto something. Yakuba began visiting many villages to, to influence them, to convince them to adopt the Zion. And he invited representatives of those villages to come to the village of Gurga, where he lives, to share their experience in what was called a Zion market. For saying to there. In we brought a group of 14 farmers from Niger to Yakuba and to other farmers in this region because there are other farmers innovating. What they saw impressed them so much that upon return they began trying out the Zai. In 1990 was a drought year and farmers observed that on the area that they had treated with Zai, those were the only areas where a crop was produced. So that, that triggered a complete reaction. It began snowballing. It's not a very good word for hot dry land, but, or a bushfire, or a wildfire, but it began spreading very rapidly. Sharing the knowledge has been central to Yakuba's philosophy. This building on the edge of the family compound is where he sleeps. But it's also his HQ. From here, Yakuba dispenses advice to visiting farmers who come from miles around. The seed store has been a lifeline for thousands of families. 
This is the village of Ranawa, 20 miles away. The young men here owe an unusual debt of thanks to Yakuba. Between 1975 and 1985, people were leaving the village of Ranawa in, in numbers. You had a reduction of the population by 25% in 10 years' time. And people left because there was a lot of land degradation, people couldn't harvest crops, there was no water in the wells, so the situation was very desperate. Just to give one little anecdote, girls from neighboring villages did not want to marry with boys from Ranawa because the burden of fetching water for the family was simply too big, so they avoided uh, the contact with the young men from Ranawa. In 1985, the Zai were introduced, and the Zai were the improved version of Yakuba, and that led to a rehabilitation of degraded land. So, water levels started coming up, people were able to get a harvest, even in years of lower rainfall. People no longer left the villages, not a single family has left the village since 1985. And other families began coming back, so the population doubled in the next 10 years. There is more water in the wells, there is a higher production, there is a cultivation of cash crops, there is a substantial environmental and socio-economic transformation. And that is, at least to a substantial part, related to the to Yakuba's Zai. Yakuba has never actually been to Ranawa until today. Now, for the first time, he will see for himself what his teaching has achieved. The immediate benefits of Yakuba's methods are plain to see, but there are other, less obvious effects and these have lessons for us all. Around the world, food prices are rocketing. In some countries, this has led to civil unrest. And when people have to leave their villages to live in the cities, tensions become even worse. Local businessman Baba Wedraogo owns a bar on the outskirts of Waiguya in the north of Burkina Faso. Alors, nous savons que, euh, que au, au, ici, le problème d'alimentation est prioritaire. Parce que si on, est, si on a faim, on ne peut pas aller à l'école. Si on a faim, on ne peut pas suivre des cours d'alphabétisation. Alors, depuis les années euh, 93-94, le système des ailes est développé et effectivement a permis dans les villages et dans les familles d'assurer de, 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 cette alimentation, euh, même, même, même avec peu de pluie. Alors depuis l'année passée, la famille n'a pas acheté un seul grain. Donc moi, ça m'a permis d'utiliser le peu que j'ai gagné pour développer d'autres activités comme le bar, alors qui me permet de m'accrocher dans, dans, dans ma localité et, 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 et de préserver ma dignité. Alors grâce aux aïe que Yacouba Sawadogo fait et beaucoup d'autres familles ici, et dans la, ici dans la région, euh, permet aux jeunes de, de, de rester dans les villages et de travailler aux ailes et ne pas aller dans les villes et aller vers la Côte d'Ivoire et même plus loin vers l'Europe et prendre des risques inutiles pour rejoindre la vie meilleure.
C'est beaucoup l'amour à mon village. Je ne vais pas quitter, laisser nos vieilles filles aller ailleurs. Nous, nous, nous voulons rester dans le village parce que si nous quittons et laissons les vieilles, ils vont souffrir. Je ne vais pas quitter les vieilles. Je ne vais pas quitter les vieilles. Je ne vais pas quitter les la bataille manque de patron il est à amanegda totalement la puissance qu'on a amanegda It's the end of the rainy season and the most important day of the year has finally arrived Harvest Before any work can start Yakuba gathers his family together for a team briefing. Kang <laughs> <laughs> C'est un peu 
de panafuti la fsel na ne bali ngande inafuti Yakuba's father would no doubt be proud. His son has battled with nature and man to provide a lifeline to thousands of families. But his struggle is far from over. A peril far greater than the desert wind is approaching, and it threatens to destroy everything. <laughs> The nearby city of Waiguya is home to over 70,000 people. It's the country's fourth largest city, but it's about to get a lot bigger. A huge urban expansion scheme is underway, and Yakuba's farm is right in its path. Like most farmers in the area, Yakuba owns his land. But last summer, officials arrived and set about driving concrete boundary stakes into the ground. Yakuba estimates that up to 80% of his land will be lost to new housing development. Nothing is secure. The forest, the fields. There's even a plotting line which splits the grave of Yakuba's father right in two. Even Yakuba's seed store, the hub of his operation during the day and where he sleeps at night, has not escaped. A stake has been driven right through the center. The building will have to be demolished. Yakuba and all the other farmers who live within the vast expansion scheme will lose out. They will no longer be able to grow crops on their land. Instead, they will be forced into an urban lifestyle. 
Urban expansion has become a threat to Yakuba because the town is growing bigger. But it is vital that Yakuba's, what Yakuba has created in the last 20, 25, 30 years, that that is being preserved. There is no other area in the Sahel that I know about where there is such a large biodiversity managed by a farmer. Can it really be that all Yakuba's work over the last 30 years will be destroyed? Confronting the authorities will be a formidable task, but as news of his work starts to reach the outside world, events in Yakuba's life take on another twist. The peasant farmer from Africa really has arrived in downtown DC. He's been invited by Oxfam America as part of a small delegation of innovating farmers from the Sahel. They are here to present their case to the heart of the Obama administration here in Washington. It will be a non-stop round of meetings and presentations on Capitol Hill. He has never been to the United States and he got an opportunity to present his experience at Capitol Hill. I think there are very few farmers in Burkina Faso who have had that opportunity so far. And he could inform staffers of Congress about his experience and with a bit of luck some of his ideas and some of his experience will be fed into Obama's Global Food Security Initiative. What a chance! Yakuba, good morning. We'll start today with your presentation. And Monsieur Bikenga has, has uh, offered to translate for you. I think Yakuba's achievements are extremely in inspiring. It's amazing what he's achieved, but I think it also is, is a real lesson in how what can be achieved if you work at the community level. Hearing the story of someone who's had a huge success um, by patience and persistence, knowing, knowing his local community, knowing the people that he's working with, um, is very, very inspiring for someone like me who doesn't get to see that day to day. Oftentimes we have uh, academics getting together talking about issues. We have NGOs getting together and talking about issues. And the government talks among itself all the time, but it's rare that we get all three together. And, and especially having that fourth element, people like Yakubu involved as well. That's not a very common occurrence. I wanted to bring the leaders and the people who led this and hear from them the elements of their success story. And I wanted them to talk to the Washington community at a time when new policies are being developed for agriculture and agricultural investments.
Yakuba's whirlwind tour of Capitol Hill is regarded as a success. And on his last night in the U.S., he is an honored guest of the ambassador of Burkina Faso. I think it was very important to have such people in America. Many small uh, um, farmers in the um, third world uh, is waiting for innovating methods for agriculture. And to have one such uh, Yakuba in Burkina Faso and in Sahel, I mean in uh, a large part of West Africa, is something very important. It's a good example for the future of agriculture and for food security in the world. Yakuba and his family gather for a group photograph. It will mark the end of an eventful year. There remain many unresolved problems. The battle to defend his home against the encroaching city is far from over. But there is some respite. The authorities have at least agreed to leave his forest alone. And despite the continued threat to the rest of his land, Yakuba finds reasons to be optimistic. <laughs> Nikiama <laughs> <laughs>